And uh, Richard asked me to talk a little bit about the Upper Skagit Valley uh, to the group. Um, before I do that, you know, I'd be really remiss if I didn't talk about the salmon briefly. I think Tom touched on it briefly, but the salmon are still continuing to hurt. Uh, this particular year, the spring Chinook are down again. The summer, fall, our stocks are as low as I've seen them in many, many years. So we're very concerned uh, that, that that trend is continuing to occur. And uh, I want to assure the group too that you know the tribe is doing everything we can that we do have control on to ensure that we have sustainable runs. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But back to the history component of the tribe, for those that don't know Upper Skagit, uh, uh, we inhabited the Skagit River, obviously, from Mount Vernon to the Seattle City Light Project area. Uh, we're actually the largest of the Skagit tribes. Um, out of the three, you have the Swinomish, of course, and the, and the Sox Suatl here in the Skagit Valley also, too. And um, for 10,000 years, we were the stewards of these resources and protector of the salmon. And we continue that role to this very day. You know, in 1974, we were reaffirmed as a co-manager legally through the U.S. v. Washington case, along with the state of Washington. And uh, when the Skagit Watershed Council was formed, I'll be frank, and again, my intent is not to offend anyone, but to give a historical perspective and, and also uh, understand that, you know, when, when we're talking uh, about these issues, we feel we're talking on behalf of the salmon, as most of us here do, and the intent is not to offend any entity or any individual particular individual, that is certainly not the intent. But as a co-manager, uh, it is our duty with the state and the tribes to ensure that we have sustainable fish runs. Now, our goal is to integrate that through the Watershed Council process. Again, you know, we, we initially we were reluctant to join the process for a couple of reasons. We didn't have the infrastructure to participate adequately, we felt, and then we still haven't figured out how to uh, integrate the co-management authority on, on the decision-making process. And we hope to achieve that someday by working with the state and tribes and how to uh, provide or assist the uh, Watershed Council with some policy level directions for the sustainability of these stocks. Um, back to the, uh, to the salmon. You know, with the summer falls, as many of you are aware of, the Skagit is the heart of this Puget Sound ESL, ESU for Chinook. And, and things are just continuing to decline. And uh, right now what the tribe is doing is, it's our goal to provide the best available science for what we're doing to ensure that we're not harming the resource. And an example for this particular year, uh, uh, we use what's called a FRAM model, uh, forecasted return assessment model is what it is. And there's a new version out there, FRAM 7 it's called, and we were pushing very hard to use that uh, assessment model on how we manage our fisheries in the river for this year. Unfortunately, we weren't able to achieve that uh, agreement with, the, uh, with some of the other co-managers. However, that's an example of the tribe looking to update our science to ensure that we're, we uh, are not harming these stocks. And, uh, to the upper Skagit Valley component, you know, um, we find ourselves sharing more and more of our history. Uh, it's something we've been reluctant to do for many, many years. We like to, upper Skagit's been very private. We've liked to keep our, our, our history and culture to ourselves. But, you know, with things going on, the salmon decline, and we've been forced to share more and more of our history and culture with, with everybody. So they understand where we're coming from, if you would. And the upper Skagit Valley is very spiritual to my tribe. Um, and I want people to understand, you know, when I say that, uh, and again, going into a little bit of a detail, we believe that life began there in the Upper Skagit Valley. And, and all cultures have that aspect of where things first began. And this is something that I'm sharing for the first time with a lot of folks that you haven't ever heard before. And so, again, we're forced to share that why we're protecting the salmon. We're so adamant about what we're doing. Now we're working with our friends from City Light and uh, I work closely with Chris Townsend who's about to speak after me. And, uh, and uh, um, one of the main objectives, um, again, I don't want people to believe that this is just all about being adversarial. And we're speaking for, this, for what the salmon need at this point. Again, they are in dire need right now. We're trying to bring the best available science to understand the impacts of what's going on in the upper Skagit Valley to a level that we can have a little bit of certainty or as much certainty as we possibly can in 2021, because this is gonna, uh, uh, 
go into the two, 50, possibly 50 years, the next license. And so um, we're very interested in hearing uh, what, what Chris has to say. We're interested in hearing and how that uh, funding level was determined because, you know, we just haven't been able to reach agreement on many of these uh, studies. In fact, most of these studies, we're con continuing to have these conversations with, with City Light and all the other LPs. And we hope to resolve this uh, again for the benefit of the salmon. Again, in closing, I want to thank everybody for their hard work and the accomplishments to date. I want to thank Richard and I want to thank uh, Peter for looking for some uh, leadership uh, uh, through the Watershed Council and we're always willing to, to work with everyone. So again, thanks everyone. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be um, talking with all of you today. Um, I view this group as the, as the real champions of, of one of the most special places left in Puget Sound. And um, again, I think I was just introduced as the, my name is Chris Townsend, I'm the Director of Natural Resources and Hydro Licensing at Seattle City Light. And although I have over 20 years of experience in the Puget Sound region um, as a natural resource manager for public entities, I've only been at City Light for about two years. And one of the things that attracted me to working for City Light was the um, ability um, and honor to work um, in a river system that has been part of my life for as long as I can remember. Hiking and crossing through and spending time in the in the all all all, all reaches of that of the beautiful valley that um, is the Skagit. Um, my background is in um, ecosystem management. I wrote my master's thesis way back in the early 90s on ecosystem management, and I had the pleasure to work at the Puget Sound Partnership, who I see there are several representatives on today, um, on write, writing the first ecosystem management plan for Puget Sound, or being a, uh, helping with the, the production of that um, first action agenda. And I tell you that because uh, Seattle City Light has recently made a... Um, a solid commitment to focusing on um, the Skagit River as an ecosystem in our relicensing process. Now, um, we all know that that can be um, lip service or it can be real. And um, I believe that with the assistance of the um, partners that we're working with from tribes and federal and state and local agencies that we can truly make this a new and innovative approach to relicensing. And at a minimum, um, ecosystems realize the interconnectedness of all aspects of the ecological setting. And it also takes into consideration the cultural and spiritual, historical and legal aspects among other things that are overlain on top of that. So I believe that we're at the beginning of a, of a new and exciting opportunity to really um, create a license that looks at the total health of the Skagit River ecosystem as we move forward. Um, I'd like to also start, thank you, um, Richard, for recognizing the territorial lands that, um, that the Skagit is located in. Um, and I'd also like to do that. We are, um, are very aware and respectful of the fact that our project is located on and influences the territory of at least three um, Native American tribes, including the Upper Skagit, the Soxhawtl, and the Swinomish. And there are many more when you consider the entire 100 mile length of the transmission corridor between the dam and the city of Seattle. And in addition to that, we have several uh, First, Nation, um, First Nations in Canada that whose territory has traditionally extended into the project area. And um, we are aware of that and, and have an obligation to um, work closely with the trust agencies that, that hold the tribal treaty rights and trust. And as Deborah said at a recent meeting, we do have a moral obligation to do the right thing. And uh, we will continue to work closely with our tribal partners to identify the right measures to mitigate for the impacts of this project for the next license period. But before we move into identifying mitigation measures, I think you all know that we need to identify the science needed to support good decision making. And we are really, um, even though there's been a lot of information um, and a lot of, um, of, of, of heat and light, shall I say, um, about the process, we really are in the very early stages of the FERC relicensing process. That process started with a, a, a pre-process in I think 2018 or 2019 before I started at Seattle City Light, uh, working with partners to identify the studies needed to support 
relicensing. And that turned into a bit of a rocky road and um, City Light understands its role in, 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 that, in that situation. But it did culminate in um, 20, early 2020 with the um, publication of the filing of a, a proposed study plan. And that plan included about 28 um, individual studies that at the time we estimated would cost about $10 million. After we filed that plan, um, licensed participants filed study requests as per the, the um, process, and we received about 95 um, new requests for studies, some of them overlapping, so they weren't unique requests, but and many of them overlapping with what we'd already proposed. But that was quite a volume of, of work to um, sort through those. And um, But the process that FERC um, has set out um, does um, anticipate that we would work closely with the licensing participants to um, narrow the difference between our proposed study plan and their study requests. And we did go through an intensive period of um, many meetings, um, including 10 half day meetings where we um, engaged with the um, licensed participants to better understand what their interests are and what their requests were. And we were able to, um, through that process and a renewed effort by City Light to focus on an ecosystem approach, um, pr finally propose 33 studies in our revised study plan, which we just filed a few weeks ago. Um, and and those plan, to implement those plans, we estimate will cost about $24 million. And I only bring up the dollars to show the order of magnitude of adjustment that we have made between the, um, the proposed study plan and the revised study plan. And that really represents about a million dollars a month in science that is gonna be going on the ground in the next two years. And so that, that's a significant effort to really collect good information that we're gonna to need to make our decisions as we move closer to the um, time where we need to apply for a license. Um, I have to also acknowledge, um, especially for our partners, Scott and others who are on line today, that we haven't met every request. We have not met every request. Um, we tried as much as we could to get there, uh, but we know that there are some information that has been requested that uh, we have not um, agreed to conduct. Um, I hope that we can, through further um, discussion, come to an understanding, and if we um, if we do, we can either incorporate um, additional information into the revised study plan process or even agree to do it um, outside of the study plan to support specifically um, the identification and the implementation of mitigation measures. I think we all in this process realize that we can't stop studying after the two-year FERC study process. That's not a good way to approach science. We need to um, uh, commit to um, investigating the um, effectiveness of the mitigation measures that we've identified to make sure they're performing as they should and to be able to make adjustments during the course of the next license period. We do expect a 30 to 50 year licenses. So that's a significant period of time that we're trying to identify mitigations for. And um, there is no possible way that we could have all the information and knowledge and foresight to identify all of the right measures um, at one point in time. And so we need to have a, a, the flexibility to make adjustments as we go forward in the next license. Um, let's see. So I was asked by Richard to go into an overview of the studies that we're committing to, um, especially as they relate to science. So uh, although we do have significant um, studies that we're doing that are related to um, cultural resources and recreation and aesthetics and other items, I will focus on, um, on those things that are, are significant that we're doing that will um, inform decisions related to um, salmon health. So I'll start with something that is near and dear, especially to the Upper Skagit tribe, and that is fish passage. Um, our original proposal, we were planning to take a phased approach and look at um, water flows in what's now called the bypass reach, the dry stretch of river between Gorge Dam and the powerhouse, and determine the optimal flows for uh, passage of anadromous fish beyond that point, and then look at uh, fish passage over Gorge Dam. Through the course of our conversations and um, interactions with licensed participants, 
Um, recently, we have agreed to study fish passage over all three of the Skagit River dams, including uh, passage up and the um, passage of juveniles um, downstream. And um, there has been some concern that um, City Light really take a, a, an unbiased approach and we recognize the need to do that. It's a very important topic. And one of the measures that we've taken um, to ensure that we have um, as unbiased approach as possible is to embed a National Marine Fisheries Service dam engineer in the team that's designing that study. And we also have proposed other methods to make sure that we have a trusted and credible report at the end of the, um, at the, end of the study. Um, in conjunction with the fish passage study, National Marine Fisheries Service and the Upper Skagit Tribe and others asked that we do an analysis of potential habitat in the tributaries of Ross Reservoir. And um, we have a start on an early action study that many of you are familiar with, the food web study that's been underway for a couple of years. And, and there's an, at least another year of research on that study that's necessary. But many of the studies that we've agreed to do that look at um, habitat productivity in the tributaries of the upper reservoir will integrate with that um, information that we're currently collecting. Um, so, and specifically, I mean, I, maybe I'll, I'll hold the details. Um, some of you have heard it and we can cover it in questions afterwards if you would like a little bit more detail of what, that, of what those studies will include. Um, in addition to looking above the dams, we are um, looking at a number of issues below the dams. One important um, set of studies that we're looking at is related to water quality. And we've had extensive conversations uh, focusing on um, the Department of Ecology and their responsibility to implement the 401 water quality program. And um, we have, um, I believe, come to um, a pretty close agreement with this, the uh, parameters that they um, would like us to study. And we've expanded um, the number of sampling sites and extended the sampling season to the full two year study period. Uh, for most of the parameters. And we've added things like BMI sampling and turbidity sampling um, that were requested uh, by many of the licensed participants. Um, regarding the turbidity sampling, we have revised the study plan um, to state that the sampling approach is designed to measure turbidity and TSS during all times of the year to characterize the background conditions during minimum water surface elevations in winter, reservoir refilling in spring, and normal maximum water surface elevation during the summer, and, and again, uh, along with the uh, uh, reservoir drawdown in the fall. So it was important to many licensed participants that we look at the full range of turbidity, and we've agreed to do that. Um, we've also agreed to do uh, water quality monitoring in the bypass reach along with flow studies. So um, and I think many of you know that we have committed to putting flow back in the bypass reach as soon as we can. And uh, if we can reach agreement on all the different um, aspects um, that are required to do that. Um, and certainly if, if we don't do it before the new license, we have uh, pre-committed to putting flows in the bypass reach in the new license period. So all of these studies will inform what those flows will look like in the flow plan that we agree to in the, in the new license and will be required to do in a new license. Um, we're also uh, proposing to collect temperature data um, at many locations, uh, including below the SOC confluence. Um, and I'll talk more about the studies below the SOC in a, in a moment, but um, we are collecting temperature above and below the Baker River. Those are added points that we um, have agreed to look at um, temperature. Um, In-stream flows are another um, significant area that we're conducting um, a lot of studies, mostly models. Um, and we have amended our um, original in-stream flow modeling plan to add additional transects and to um, run model scenarios um, that are requested by the LPs. And, and let me say that slightly differently. We're creating a model um, that LPs will be able to request scenarios that will run. Um, and uh, we'll also train um, par uh, partners to run their own scenarios if, um, if we don't feel that 
uh, the collectively the group of licensed participants feel that certain um, scenarios are related to what we should be looking at. So anybody can run a scenario uh, with the new in-stream flow model. Um, and we'll also be modeling um, in-stream flows, like I said before, in the bypass reach. And we are um, working with partners to identify the number of transects and the location of transects. So it should be a fairly thorough um, effort. And um, in addition to in-stream flows, we're looking at many um, different studies related to geomorphology. We're planning to model sediment transport using a HECRAS 2D model. Um, that will look at algorithms and focus areas. We're, we don't feel that it's possible to do it in the entire river, but we will be working with participants to identify focus areas to conduct that modeling. Um, and we will also, as part of that work, be looking at um, sediment augmentation um, for um, situations where sediment is, is limiting um, healthy habitat. Um, in addition, uh, we'll be collecting the data necessary to calibrate those models. And I hope I'm not going into too much detail for you. I know some of you are scientists and are, are interested, but we will be redoing the green LIDAR and aerial photographs um, in August of 2021. And if high enough flow occurs we'll, um, we'll, to move sediment, we'll look again in 2022. So depending on the flows that we get this year. Um, we're going to be adding scour monitors, hydrophones, and bed load transport sampling areas and focus areas uh, to tributaries upstream from the confluence to determine tributary flows that initiate transport and transport volumes. Um, we'll be measuring the depth and velocity at selected tributary alluvial fans. We'll be um, looking, we'll be tagging and monitoring the movement and fate of gravel deposits, the mouths of selected tributaries. We'll also be doing that for large wood to investigate how large wood moves through the entire system from the upper river down to the estuary. And uh, we'll be running model scenarios to look at flows needed to move sediment and the feasibility of sediment and focus areas. So this is um, a, a, a long and complex conversation we've been having with licensed participants related to process flows. And um, there have been some significant disagreements on how we go about doing that, but our approach, and I think we're getting closer to agreement on this, is that we need to develop the tools and collect the information in order to be able to model those process flows so that we know what the range of possibilities are and what the desirable flows would be to restore um, process, actual process forming flows in, in a way that we can actually do. Um, so that's a, a high level overview. I, I think we I think the RSP that we published was a several thousand pages and uh, we can go into any of those details offline uh, maybe. But the final, the final area that I wanted to talk about was um, the studies that we're committing to below the SOC. And this is an area that is still, um, I think one of the um, areas of greatest contention. And there was um, requests for information collection um, below the SOC. Um, uh, that we did not agree to do, but what we did agree to do is to collect and synthesize all of the available information that's currently in, um, you know, available, readily available for, or, or available um, for the area between the SOC and the estuary, and to identify data gaps that would um, inform the identification of mitigation measures that we could take to influence um, any particular um, element of the environment uh, between the SOC and the estuary. So it's a, it's a slightly different approach. Um, and um, hopefully um, over the next weeks and months, we'll be able to uh, come to agreement on um, exactly what the information is that will be needed to support the identification of mitigation measures. So let me just um, conclude by talking a little bit about next steps. Um, I, I already told you that we have submitted the RSP and um, comments by licensed partners are due on um, the RSP by May 6. Um, FERC at the request of the Swinomish and other parties did extend that to by two weeks so that there was a full month to read that massive document. I, I would guess that that's probably still um, a tight um, squeeze and a big demand on partners as they um, work through that material and produce their comments. We continue to meet with key parties um, during that time um, to fine tune um, our, um, our proposal, our, our, our revised study plan to FERC. Um, FERC is expected to make their um, study plan determination by late May. And after that, there's an opportunity for licensed participants who um, 
choose to do so to, to appeal or to uh, seek to resolve uh, differences that they have with the FERC study determination. And hopefully that will be all resolved in time for us to get studies, key studies into the field um, that we need to do to take advantage of the study season. And on that topic, um, City Light is doing all we can to get studies in the field this season, even if it's before final decisions are made um, by FERC and, um, and the dispute resolution process. Um, so that we can take advantage of the season. And we are fully aware that if um, different decisions are made that we may have to either lose that work or adjust it significantly to um, meet the needs of parties. But we're, we're definitely know that we're taking on that risk and we'll certainly um, make adjustments if required um, after uh, we start the implementation. But it, we just feel it's so important to start that data collection that we wanna get it in the field and, and work as closely as possible with our partners to make sure we're doing it um, in a way that will be supported by everyone when the data is available. Um, so as the studies are implemented during the next two year period, we will begin convening groups to, to discuss um, settlement agreements. And the settlement agreements are really where the details of the, of the new license commitments are hashed out. So we have a long period um, to negotiate with partners um, about those measures. Some of them will look a lot like what we had in the existing license, and some of them will be radically different, like um, the water and the bypass reach. We, we fully expect that there will be flow requirements in bypass reach in the new license, where there wasn't in the former license. Um, our draft license application is due in April 2023, and that will include the progress to date that we've reached on settlement negotiations. And we hope to basically have a comprehensive agreement by then that may not be possible. And there's ways to accommodate that um, with that particular deadline. And the goal, it may be optimistic at this point, given all the work and complexity that we're talking about is to have a new license by the time the existing one expires in um, April of 2025. Um, however, um, it is, quite common in, in large projects like this for um, a license to go into annual um, licenses, which would mean um, carrying on the existing uh, mitigation measures um, until the new license is, is issued. So that's, that's what it looks like. We're early in the process. We're working hard um, to get it right and to collect the right information. And, um, and we know that um, data collection doesn't stop with the two-year study plan. Um, it will continue, um, hopefully, for the the life of the next license so that we can verify um, that what we're doing makes a difference that we expected and that if it doesn't, that we can figure out what the right thing to do is. So I guess I'll stop there. So Scott, Skyler, um, and just, uh, you know, let's recognize the uh, great speakers and um, that we're, you know, trying to be respectful and not negotiate here in public, um, clarifying questions, particularly from non-licensed uh, uh, participants. But Scott, you're up. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Chris, and again, I want to reiterate, you know, where the, the, the tribe is right now. In 2021, this year, we actually cut out our, our ceremonial fish for this year. That's how bad the salmon are this particular year. That's a sacrifice, you know, we feel we should never have to do. And that just lets you know the extent of what we're doing. And, you know, we hope to resolve our current differences in, in the scope of these studies. And you'd mentioned that there's a potential for conversations to occur, particularly on issues that are very near and dear to us, like the fish passage study and the interconnectivity to all the other studies that the fish passage should be uh, connected to. So uh, is there a real possibility that we can get together with the LP sometime soon and uh, have those frank discussions or, or city light, basically where they feel they're gonna be uh, on that particular issue, fish passage? Well, um, Scott, as you know, we are having conversations um, with licensed participants um, and uh, as we have been and we have more scheduled um, to talk to um, uh, especially National Marine Fishery Service and Department of Ecology and, and tribes as we move forward. We don't have current plans to um, schedule um, group meetings. We think that tactical focus meetings on specific issues will be um, the uh, most strategic way to address issues. Um, but if there was a request to meet, um, we would be more than welcome to meet um, on, a, on a group basis. I think, I think we've demonstrated that as it, through the process. Um, thank, thank, 
Thank you very much for that, Chris. I just full transparency. I, you know, I would like to say that, you know, I think we're very far apart on a lot of the studies for the group's understanding. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Scott and Chris. Hi, hey, Richard. This is Brandon Rusin. I have a quick question. Um, so um, uh, you made some reference to managing uh, the entire ecosystem or Skagit River ecosystem as part of the new license. Um, how does the the study area, the, the plan area, the license area overlap or play in, into some of that? Um, is it the entire reach of the river or is it just different sections? Um, well, first of all, um, I have to um, clarify if I if I indicated that City Light wants to be um, a manager of the entire ecosystem, that's inaccurate. We, of course, don't have authority to manage, but we do have um, a big impact on um, on the river. And um, I think licensed participants have indicated already their belief that we impact the river all the way to the estuary. And that's that's likely true. And that's why we're looking at the um, at the studies below the sock that I described earlier, which again, I acknowledge Scott's statement that it's not doing as, as much or even I think Scott would characterize um, nearly enough um, and below the sock. Um, but we do um, anticipate having discussions about mitigation measures that could extend um, all the way to the estuary. The, the fact that our science isn't necessarily um, collecting original information um, that far down doesn't mean that um, there couldn't be a case made that some of the um, mitigation actions couldn't happen um, anywhere in the watershed. That, that would be a decision of, of those with the authority to, um, you know, to, to regulate and require and, um, you know, it would, be, it would be in the form of a mitigation measure that we would agree to do that. I appreciate it. Thank you uh, for answering that. I, I didn't really know how to ask it because I'm just trying to understand your guys' licensing process just as much as uh, everybody else. And I know that there's different boundary lines and I didn't know how how study plans overlap with mitigation areas and, and all that stuff. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Mr. John Vander Hayden's got his hand up. Uh, one quick question on what you anticipate uh, FERC's reaction to your um, study proposals are. Do you have any anticipation? And in particularly, how long do you think they will take to review um, and give the go ahead on whatever gets finalized? Well, thank you. Good question. Our, our team believes that we have proposed um, a sufficient number of studies and, and quality and covering sufficient topics to um, meet their requirements. Um, I think, in fact, we've, we may have um, and likely have gone beyond what FERC would actually require. Um, we feel that they will actually stick to their statutory um, deadline of making their decision. I think it's May 21st. Um, Andrew can put something in the chat if I got that wrong. Um, and then there, there will be the dispute resolution process. But I wanna make an important point that, um, I mean, it is decision, it, it is FERC's decision to make what is in the um, final study plan determination, but City Light fully intends to implement all of the studies that we proposed in the revised study plan, regardless of whether or not FERC requires us to. And furthermore, we'll make every effort to keep it on the same schedule as all of the other studies, unless we're advised by our licensed partners that um, there should be an adjustment. So I just, that's an important point that I wanna make that we're committed to doing that entire scope of studies that we proposed in the, re in the revised study plan. I don't see any other hands up. Actually, uh, Richard, I had a question for uh, Chris. Um, Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, and I, I want to respect your, you know, effort to try to bring everybody together and keep this, uh, uh, you know, based on dialogue. And so, you know, I do also want to, um, and we don't intend to negotiate anything, uh, but I, I think there's some misunderstanding where the county's coming from. First of all, we stand with the tribe and we support their efforts in this process. You know, Chris, I'm not sure the ILP process is going as well as you're suggesting, like Scott said, but I, I want to make it clear for all the Watershed Council members, you know, the county's criticism here is, is a little bigger picture. You know, first of all, I mean, I, I mentioned it a lot, but I want to restate it because it's a real important fact, and that is 
under the current license, Seattle's salmon investment is 59 times less than what Puget Sound Energy did a few years later, 37 times less than the regional average. These are facts. They're based on public records from NIMS in Seattle. And, um, you know, we, and the other thing is we're ready, willing, and able to help plan and execute the tribe's recovery objectives, including restoration of delta estuarine function and ecosystem scale culvert replacement. What's lacking is uh, a one-time capital infusion. You know, nobody's, Tom, I want to, in, in response to your statement to Commissioner Browning, you know, nobody's knocking on doors and asking to buy Sullivan Hacienda or any of these significant things. And that's, that's what's needed. We are right there. We, we agree this needs to happen because we're not going to have peace in this valley until we meet the tribe's recovery objectives. Um, not to mention recovering harvested levels of salmon. Now, Chris, here, here's my question. I mean, and I, I, I want to put it out there and I think we need to have a dialogue about it. And we, you know, we just need to be transparent. You know, I, I hear you saying we need a lot of science, but that's ultimately a sort of implication that what we're going through in this process and this conflict is somehow inevitable. That's not, we know that's not necessary. You know, of course, when PSE came forward for a license, they basically just came forward with a $170 million investment for the tribe's recovery objectives rather than dragging our community through the years long conflict. Uh, you also entered a settlement in 1990 because some tribes agreed to it. So you can do whatever people agree to. Um, and let's, so let's be professional here and acknowledge that Seattle just had no interest in coming forward with anything like that. And it feels to us like that's why we're here in this conflict. So I asked you in the, our last meeting, you're Seattle, you, you know, you, you, it would cost based on the numbers we've run using a, you know, a regionally proportionate investment number predicated off PSE's numbers, it cost everybody about a cup of a latte a month in Seattle. You know, why as an organization, this is Seattle, right? You're not a private investor owned utility. You're, uh, you know, the greenest utility in the nation is self-identified. Self so why then, and why aren't you now coming forward with that approach? Um, we don't understand. And, you know, I think it would help all of us to get an answer to that question. You know, maybe there's a good reason that we don't know. I just, we just haven't heard it yet. So what we don't want is we've had a lot of conflict over the failure to meet the tribe's recovery objectives. And we want to move on from that. And we think this is an important step to accomplish. It. So that's, that's the question. Can you, you know, I'm not, this is not a gotcha thing, right? Obviously, this is a thing for us. And we'd like, we'd like an explanation. And it, it, good, bad, and different, we'd like to hear it. Yeah, thank you, Will, um, uh, for, for uh, bringing that up. And um, I would like to take an opportunity to clarify a few things. First of all, um, we are going through a regulatory process that is directed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that basically anticipates um, producing information that's needed to support decision-making. And that's followed by the identification of mitigation measures, which then become commitments in the new license. And, and what I hear you asking for is for us to just come up with um, a bucket of money or mitigation measures prior, at, at, prior to implementing those steps. I think that you're Characterization of the Baker process is a vast oversimplification. There was process used to identify mitigation measures and it ended up costing a certain amount of money. There may have been other agreements involved with that that involved also payments, but um, they also had to go through the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission process. Second, I'd like to point out that the comparisons that you make are inaccurate in a few ways. First of all, the license that we, was issued to us in 1995, we started negotiating in 1977. And even by 1995, when we reached a comprehensive settlement agreement, which was one of the first in the country with all of the parties in, involved at the time, based on what we knew, um, that was prior to the listing of species under the Endangered Species Act. So we were in a pre-Endangered Species Act environment where um, we didn't have the same um, regulations and benchmarks to achieve as all of the other projects that you're comparing us to. You're basically comparing an old pre-ESA license and the costs associated with that with post-ESA licenses.